people um, hear me. Um, well, thank you for the introduction, Anna, and uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a shame we can't all be together in Nicosia, where I bet the weather's nicer than in London, but still a pleasure to share a screen with you all. Um, it's a bit weird because the only thing I can see is my slide, so it's a bit disconcerting. Um, anyway, today I'm going to talk about the records relating to archaeology in Cyprus that we hold at the National Archives of the United Kingdom. Um, now, I know you're all experienced researchers, but I thought that it would be useful perhaps to highlight the type of records we hold and how to find the hidden ones. Um, when, when I started the National Archives many, many years ago and told my boss that I would like to focus on the history of archaeology in our records, he was extremely sceptical because we are the archive of the central government. So we collect, preserve and make accessible uh, records created by central government departments. And we tend not to have private papers, for instance. And yet the records we hold relating to the history of archaeology in Cyprus and elsewhere, to be fair, are incredibly varied. I've always thought that working in an archive was quite similar to being an archaeologist in maybe a bit less dusty. I oh, know, actually, it's just as dusty in less muddy and hot than um, depending on where you dig. Um, and for me, the strongest similarity be between archival work and archaeology is this sometimes invigorating, sometimes very frustrating mix of serendipity and thorough forensic examination of facts and sites. Because, as we all know, there is a bit of serendipity. Sometimes you find something by accident while uh, looking for something entirely different, and it completely changes the, the nature of your narrative. And that is what uh, Mike Featherstone described as the archival flannery. And he wrote, once in the archive, finding the right material which can be made to speak make, may itself be subject to a high degree of contingency. The process not of deliberate rational searching, but serendipity. Here we think of the flaneur who wanders the archival textual city in a half dreamlike state in order to be open to the half formed possibilities of the material and sensitive to unusual juxtapositions and novel perceptions. And it's not so different from the way in which some archaeological discoveries are made. Um, thinking of the farmer who, when digging a water well, stumbled upon the terracotta army in China, for instance. In in an archive, as in the case of an archaeological discovery, you are drawn to certain characters or storylines, but you still must be open-minded enough and astute enough to be able to exploit them. And sometimes it's not serendipity at all, but painstakingly precise scientific work based on very solid knowledge. There is obviously more to archival work and to archaeology than serendipity. Like archaeology, archival work is the systematic excavation of not a shaft or, or a site, but a record series. And you can follow the different archival layers as you would follow geological strata. And the only way to do this is to know your administrative history, to know your archive, and to understand why we hold what we hold. So just a few words about the National Archives for those of us, uh, those of you uh, perhaps less familiar um, with us. We are really the National Archives for England and Wales. Um, Scotland and Northern Ireland have their own archives. As I said earlier, we're the, the UK government archive. So we take in the records of government. And we're a government department ourselves. We report to the Department of Media, Culture and Sports. Uh, we're also the sector leader for archives in England, which means we provide advice, guidance and sometimes funding. And importantly, we're also an independent research organisation, an IRO, which means that we are, we are a research active organisation across a number of fields, including historical and scientific research into our collections, um, digital and preservation and conservation. So how did we get here? Um, I'll try not to bore you to death with our own administrative history, but hopefully you'll see why I, I really want to mention it all. So I'm going to take you back to the time of the Norman kings when the monarch conducted the practical business of the state through a court council known as the Curia Regis, the king's court. And 
this wasn't a settled court. It followed, it used to follow the king in the course of his travels. And the business of courts produced written records which formed part of the king's treasure. And they were kept in whichever royal palace the king happened to be residing at the time. The result of this was that the king's records were kept in a, in a number of different locations. And government became gradually more complex. And by the 13th century, a number of distinct governmental entities distilled out of the king's council. And they, they each fulfilled different functions. And they came to have permanent courts at Westminster. And they ceased to travel with the kings. As the departments of state um, ceased to travel with the king and developed settled bases, their records came to be stored at settled places. And the different departments all came to have their own treasuries or record repositories. Each department, and that's maybe the important bit, it, each department became responsible for the preservation of their records and of how these records could be searched. And the result of that was numerous different systems and locations. By the 18th century, records of government were spread across some 60 different repositories, most of them in London, but not all of them. And as these um, quotes highlight on, on, on the left hand side of the slide, confused chaos under cobwebs, dust, filth, miscellaneous masses lying in the same state for centuries, which seems um, uncannily familiar even today. Um, well, it just shows that locating records was, was a rather difficult matter. And that's where the rat makes an entrance. Um, following a series of investigations in the early 19th century, a man named Henry Cole began working with the records of the British government. And he was really shocked at their poor condition. And he pioneered reform um, in the way in which the historic documents of government were kept. And he helped to create what became known as the Public Record Office, or PRO, which is our predecessor, really. And then this little rat, um, it, it's much smaller than it looks. It was a bit disappointed. I was a bit disappointed the, the, the first time I saw it, but it's still great to have it. Um, this little rat had a stomach full of chewed documents, and he was used as evidence for the poor condition of the records and ended up becoming part of the collection itself. Um, as you can see, it, it, it has a, a reference number and you can actually order him up. Um, in, in the 19th century, though, there was a pretty big limitation as there was no formal requirement for government departments to transfer their papers and to make them available for public access. And until the Public Records Office Act of 1877 and 1898, there was also no provision for the destruction of material not selected for preservation. Um, so really, we had a, a complete lack of a systematic procedure for, for government records. And this led to various investigations and um, reforms. Um, so all of this to say it is important to understand the inner workings of a government department to find records. And that's obviously the case when you look at the history of archaeology in Cyprus. As um, as you know, Cyprus was held by Venice until it was incorporated into the Ottoman Empire. It was then handed over to Britain for administrative purposes, although not formally ceded. And then when the First World War broke out in 1914 and the Ottoman Empire entered the war alongside Germany and her allies, um, Cyprus was annexed to the British crown. This annexation was formally recognized by Greece and Turkey by the Treaty of Lausanne, and then Cyprus became a crown colony and remained one until 1960 when it became an independent republic. So that's a slightly complicated and fragmented administrative history. And in terms of records held by the National Archives, it means also a slightly complicated mix and slightly fragmented mix of foreign office, colonial office, Commonwealth relations office, and what we call the migrated archives. I'll come back to that later. And this obviously comes on top of the usual mix of war office, cabinet office, prime minister's office, and treasury records. Um, as Thomas Kiley and Anya Ulrich wrote, hi Thomas, 
Um, the period between 1878 and 1960 in Cyprus witnessed key developments such as the evolution of legislative, administrative and institutional frameworks, as well as the emergence of recognisably modern standards of excavation, publication and the conservation of sites and monuments. And this is exactly what you can trace in the records of the British government. As, as we all know, archaeology and geopolitics or imperial politics have always been tightly linked. And this was obviously also the case in Cyprus. And this is why there is such a variety of records relating to the archaeology of the island at the National Archives, even if they're not always um, easy to find. So before we get on to how to find these records or, or find the less identifiable ones, what types of records will you find which can shed light on the history of archaeology in Cyprus? Well, you will find correspondence and minutes from all the relevant departments. So Colonial Office, Foreign Office, then Foreign and Commonwealth Office, Dominions Office, because Commonwealth Relations Office came under the Dominions Office, Treasury, because it's always worth following the money, etc., etc. And this correspondence is always very um, enlightening, although the minutes themselves are sometimes um, more interesting and very entertaining. I mean, foreign office and colonial office officials in particular had a very, very sharp tongue and they, they were very um, humorous. Um, you, um, you will also um, find memoranda and reports which, um, which were often enclosed in pieces of correspondence. So not only uh, administrative reports or memoranda written by colonial officials, but also sometimes reports by antiquities direct, um, directors, for instance. Um, so here's an example here um, for uh, 1948. And you will also find sometimes reports on archaeological sites themselves, um, which maybe people expect a bit less. Um, in our records, you will also find uh, laws on antiquities and um, you can find them in government gazettes. And this is um, one of them here. Um, that, that was the official journal of the colony. Um, but sometimes they were just simply enclosed in correspondence. And I find the copies you find within correspondence volumes particularly interesting because um, because it it allows for, for the tracing of all the different modifications and all the opinions on which, on which these modifications are based. And it, it's a bit like, um, almost a bit like tracking changes in words, if you like. Um, you also find archaeologists, well, records relating to archaeologists. As I said, we don't have a private correspondence, but there is a lot of correspondence between the British Museum and the Foreign Office or the Colonial Office, between archaeologists and um, local authorities. So you, you would find this. Sometimes you will also find um, records of employment or recruitment. Um, when, when a new director of antiquities was appointed, for example, um, a lot of applications um, were circulated within Colonial Office and Foreign Office. So that's quite, that's quite interesting. Um, and we also have um, a significant amount of visual material, and this includes maps, photographs, plans, and sketches. Um, these are not always um, easy to find. Um, some maps and plans and sketches were um, extracted from the, their, their parent document. Um, Sometimes you will identify them on the catalogue and sometimes you will just stumble upon them um, in um, records. Um, and then this one, which I think is 1879, um, also shows, oh no, 1878, sorry, also shows the um, identified ancient sites. So it, it's quite, these maps are, are very interesting to look at. And um, as I said, we also have plans and sketches. Um, those will most often be buried into correspondence and you'll have to either suspect there might be one or just hope it might be the case. Um, and finally, we hold a lot of photographs. Um, and 
although we have a large number of record series that are either wholly photographic or have a high concentration of photographs, much of the material remains hidden within paper files. Um, we have several million photographs, um, either wholly or partly described on the catalogue. Um, discovery um, is called the catalogue. The, the most important collection in terms of Cypriot archaeology is the Foreign and Commonwealth Office Library Photograph Collection in record series uh, CO 1069. Um, and it spans the period 1815 to 1990. And um, I know it's always a bit weird when we talk about photographs to, to say that the series starts in 1815, but that's because this series also includes um, artworks and not nice watercolours, for example, or sketches, um, uh, as well as literary works. Um, and this series covers the four of the five overseas departments of state. Um, so the colonial office, the foreign office, dominions office and the commonwealth relations office. Uh, we don't have the records of the India office. Um, so these these are really the, the different types of records that you can find at the National Archives. Now, as I said, these records are not always easy to find or to identify if you don't already know they're there. So you can do um, you can do shovel test pits or a bit of trial trenching. Um, and then let's see how far I can stretch this archaeological metaphor. Um, and then this would be this would be using Discovery, our catalog, to to run um, keyword searches either randomly across the whole catalog. Um, or more specifically um, within within particular series that you know will relate to Cyprus. And this is why at least basic knowledge of administrative history is important, because you know you, you need to know which government department might be relevant to you, um, to your period, to your topic, to be able to narrow down your searches. And even then, you'll have to sift very carefully through the debris. You need to remember that a catalog search is only as good as the catalog descriptions. So there's a lot of trial and error involved. Still, um, without a proper excavation down to bedrock, I'm really loving this metaphor. I'll stop there, I promise. Um, without a proper excavation, you won't get to uh, down to the bottom of things. The, so when I say a catalog search is only as good as the catalog descriptions are, I am sorry to add that the catalog, the catalog descriptions are sometimes vastly unhelpful. And annoyingly for us interested in the history of archaeology in Cyprus, it is especially true of Foreign Office records up to 1959 and of Colonial Office records up to 1926. So how can you follow the paper trail? And, and that's really where knowing your administrative history is important. So we know that Cyprus was part of the Ottoman Empire. And a quick catalogue search will tell you that records relating to the Ottoman Empire before 1906 are in record series um, FO78. Now, don't get me wrong, you could well order all uh, FO78 volumes and, and plough through them to find relevant items of correspondence. But... As you can see, as you can see on these slides, there are 5,491 volumes in FO78. So it will take absolutely forever. And the FO7, uh, FO78 series is a right mess. I mean, as a Middle East specialist and a, a frequent user of the series, and as um, in my, you know, official capacity as head of modern collections, I, I have... Um, a sad confession to make, FO78 gives me nightmares, actual nightmares. Um, the Ottoman Empire was very vast and all the territories are lumped together in the correspondence, except for bits of Egypt, Serbia, Montenegro and Romania. There is no discrete subseries on Cyprus, for instance. So it's very difficult to identify anything in FO78. And the only way of doing this, of so finding records relating to um, archaeology in Cyprus, is really to use the indexes and registers in FO605. Um, these indexes and registers are on microfilm and they can seem a bit daunting at first. And the whole, the whole 
process is a bit time consuming and a bit cumbersome, but it actually saves a lot of time in the long run. And, and it enables you to really find everything relevant to your topic. Um, just just one word of, of warning about these indexes and registers. They were created and they were used by the staff of the Foreign Office itself in the 19th century. So not all the correspondence to which they, they, they refer was selected for permanent preservation. So basically some of the entries refer to um, documents which no longer exist. And this can be really frustrating because sometimes you find something super exciting in FO605. Um, you order the corresponding FO78 volume only to find this super excited something was um, not preserved. So to keep things short, um, you first need to identify the relevant index. Cyprus will come under Ottoman Empire, which for Foreign Office clerks was almost always Turkey. So you'll have to look for the Turkey index in, in the series. Bit of a spoiler alert here. It's in FO605 247 uh, and it covers 1810 to 1881. Um, so, you know, that's also that's another very sad thing about about us working at the National Archives. We, we speak in reference numbers and um, sometimes we say reference numbers and we laugh or make a face. Um, Anyway, this index is arranged alphabetically and each page is divided into two columns, subjects and persons. And um, alphabetically is maybe to be taken with a bucket of salt because the, as you can see here, the alphabetical order was not always scrupulously observed. And I hear it goes from um, Cyrenaica to Cyprus, back to Serene and then to Cyprus again and then Cypher and then back to Cyprus. So you need to be slightly more meticulous and thorough than the, the poor uh, Foreign Office clerk. And then once you have found an entry you're interested in, um, here uh, Cyprus Antiquities, you'll see that the, regist the index gives you a register volume and um, a register page. Um, so the only thing you need to do is then identify the correct uh, register volume, go to the register and find your entry here um, to procure a Furman authorizing Mr. Biliotti and Suleiman to excavate and remove antiquities from Rhodes, Cyprus and Turkish Island. And this register gives you the corresponding volume of correspondence in the right hand um, column. And sometimes, as it is actually the case on this page, you have to go back a few pages to, to find it. And this is how you properly excavate Cyprus related records in the early period. Um, moving on in time, uh, responsibility for Cyprus was handed over to the colonial office. So annoyingly and fairly typically, perhaps, Colonial Office correspondence before 1926 is rather poorly catalogued. Um, as you can see here, the um, descriptions are sparse, to say the least, and vastly unhelpful, as I said before. Um, but just like the Foreign Office, the Colonial Office had an army of clerks, and you can follow the paper trail they left behind by using the, the registers of correspondence. Um, these registers of correspondence record details of all incoming correspondence. So the topic, the, the date and the sender and some information to to help the clerks find related correspondence. So they, they give details sometimes of the previous and next item of, of related correspondence, which is really handy. The, the only slightly annoying um, thing about these registers is that, well, apart from, apart from their size, and they're absolutely massive, and sometimes I can't, um, Sometimes I can't lift them myself. Um, these registers are arranged chronologically, so you really have to read through them and it can take an awful lot of time. But um, unlike the Foreign Office indexes and registers, the Colonial Office ones will always tell you whether an item of correspondence has been selected for preservation. If it hasn't, it will say destroyed under state under statute. statute. Um, which, you know, is not a happy sight, but at least you know where you stand. And the registers will always tell you whether an item um, 
um, they will also tell you whether an item of correspondence has been printed, whether for Parliament or for circulation within the colonial office itself. So it's quite interesting to see where um, the correspondence relating to archaeology in Cyprus went. Um, so a quick catalogue search will tell you that registers of correspondence for Cyprus are in series CO512. Um, annoyingly, these haven't been digi uh, digitised, so you really have to come to TNA to, to, to look at them. Um, CO512-1 covers 1878 to 1880, and it, it tells us um, that draft, num draft telegram number 17, dated 6 of August 1878, relates to antiquities. So you then need to identify the right volume of correspondence on the catalogue. Um, correspondence for Cyprus, as many of you will know, I'm sure, is held in series CO67 and covers um, 1878 to 1951. So once you have found the right volume of correspondence, in this case um, CO67 slash 1, you go to number 17 and there you are. And this is, again, cumbersome perhaps, but methodical. And if you follow the paper trail, you'll be sure not to miss anything. Now, the good news is that from 1926 onwards, records have been much better catalogued and simple catalogue searches shall be in off. Just, just maybe remember to be a bit creative with your um, keywords because the descriptions were created at the time. So you have to think like a colonial official in the 1920s or 1930s, 40s. Um, I find that usually using in turn archaeology, archaeologists, antiquities, antiques, monuments and um, discoveries uh, usually covers it all. Um, there is a last um, set of records that I'd like to talk about because they're slightly unusual. And this is series FCO 141, the records of the former colonial administrations, better known as the migrated archives. And these are records which were created by the colonial government itself, as opposed to records that you find in foreign office records or colonial office records, which were um, really the, the records of the central government department. Um, these, these were created um, in Cyprus. And the Cyprus files in FCO 141 contain a, a range of material relating to the administration of the island, including some material of a sensitive nature covering policy, security, intelligence and other issues, and including archaeology and antiquities. Um, to identify the uh, relevant files within FCO 141, you can just um, um, carry out a, a simple catalogue search. Um, in 1933, Sir Arthur Doe of the Pacific and Mediterranean Department of the Colonial Office, which is a weird mix of a department, um, wrote that in Cyprus, the preservation of antiquities was a question of first rate importance. The classical, the classical and medieval antiquities of Cyprus, he wrote, are unique of their kind within the empire. Apart from its richness in the medieval monuments of the Latin East, he continued, the island is the only fragment of classical Greek civilizations which we have in the, in the empire. Ancient and medieval monuments in Cyprus were described by colonial officials as a unique possession of the empire. For Britain, it was not only a matter of adding to museums collections or protecting cultural heritage, but one of maintaining geopolitical prestige in the Mediterranean region. And I'm, I'm very much thinking of the increase in British intervention in the 1930s that um, Thomas mentioned earlier. Um, the 1935 law on antiquity, the, on antiquities, the creation of a department of antiquities, which incidentally came much um, later than in other British colonies or territories. And then this increase is actually reflected in the records as um, papers, the number of papers of uh, on archaeology increase um, in the 1930s. And I was actually thinking earlier that um, it would be interesting, and then maybe we can discuss that um, in the Q&A, but um, I was thinking that it would be interesting to apply a bit of digital magic to Cyprus records and, and look at the data in different ways to, to, to see where, where it peaks and maybe to, to see how often or, or, 
or how rarely um, local um, archaeologists and, and curators um, or um, local workers um, come up in the records. Um, anyway, the, the question of antiquities in Cyprus was, in the words of Governor Richmond Palmer, not free from both political and other factious complications. So this is why the National Archives hold such a variety of records relating to the history of archaeology in Cyprus. And this is why it's so interesting to look at governmental records. Um, one would probably be forgiven, although perhaps not by me, um, for thinking that these records might be a bit dry, a bit administrative in nature, perhaps less relevant to today's archaeologists than excavators' notebooks or diaries or personal correspondence. But these records really allow for the exploration and excavation, to return to the archaeological metaphor, of the similarities and differences between um, between the Foreign Office and the Colonial Office in their administrative and archaeological practices, of the role in and reactions to changes of the British Museum and other institutions, and of the role played by local archaeologists and curator, who, unlike in other parts of the empire, have largely not been um, erased from the colonial um, records. You, you find um, local names much more often, I think, in records relating to Cyprus than, than in records relating to Egypt or to Iraq or Syria. Um, these governmental records can shed light on sites which, no long, which are no longer accessible, um, on how repairs were, were carried out. Um, you can see here um, repairs being carried out on the, the, the walls in Nicosia. Um, they can shed light on the provenance of certain collections or on the movement of artefacts. And I'm thinking here of the, the objects which Ronald Storrs lent to Sweden in the 1930s for, for copying. And he sent them uh, via London in the colonial office bag, um, which seems a bit hazardous. Um, but that's, that's how in the colonial office records you find a whole list of, of artefacts that were lent to Sweden. And of course, the records held at the National Archives also help us reflect on archaeological practices, past and present. So I, I hope this has been a bit useful and not too administratively boring. And um, if you'd like to work with us on projects relating to the history of archaeology in Cyprus, do drop me a line. Thank you very much. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now.